Is investment something that's always been on your mind, but you don't quite know how to get started on that journey? We are here to set you on the right course. Welcome to My Cashflow Academy's Investor's Corner with your host, Athena Paquette Cornier. We are all about getting out of the rat race through creating positive passive income through real estate investing. Here you'll hear from regular people just like you and the professionals who support us towards greater wealth. Learn before you earn, move from analysis to action, and find the right path to attaining the success that you've always dreamed of for yourself. Now, here's your host, Athena. So welcome to Investor's Corner. Uh, today is, let's see, November 6, 2021. And um, we are here as a group of people uh, who are investors. And I created this because I wanted us to be able to come here and chat with investors who have gotten out of the rat race and tell us just how they did it, no matter what the investment, how, what was their path and how did they get there and learn from the businesses who help us get there too, or expand our wealth. So today I have the extreme ple pleasure of introducing you to Sterling Lund. He's founder and president of Refuge Investments. I love that name. That's such a great name. And so Sterling uh, is going to be here to, to kind of give us a, a syndication 101. So after a career in multifamily and commercial development and construction management, doing it for other people, he decided to create a company that helps improve the condition of work Force housing and give strong returns to his investors through syndication. I actually met Sterling through a group called um, Magnify Your Wealth, another great title, isn't it? Um, so if you want to learn more about that, be sure to message me and I'll give you more details on that. But it's a great group. Um, you learn a lot and um, we happen to meet there and you're in a, you're, you're like two or three days in a room with like-minded investors. So I encourage you to look into that, but that's how I met Sterling and his fabulous wife. So uh, Sterling is here to give us a syndication one-on-one lesson, just how to do it, who it's for and who it's not. And in my opinion, it's kind of funny because syndication is for those who want to be super passive, but also want to be super active. So for the investor, you don't want to be the manager of managers, which is what we end up being, right? Managing our teams everywhere we own property. So that can be a lot of work and a lot of time out of our schedule. Uh, but then if you're someone who knows how to put deals together and you want to be in it and create it, then syndication is for you too. So it's for everyone. Um, so without further ado, I want to just add in that as far as I know, Sterling is not an attorney. I am not an attorney and we're not giving you financial advice. This is purely for educational purposes. So now for sure, without further ado, Sterling, thank you for joining us today. Oh, uh, thank you, Athena. Thanks for the invitation. Yeah, glad to be here. so glad to have you here. So tell us a little bit about um, you and how you came to do what you're doing and why syndication was important in that. Well, I, uh, you alluded to it earlier. I've been in the uh, multifamily apartment space most of my career and happened to be building for a lot of large developers, even down here in California, some major projects. And over time, I had learned that it was a passion of mine to be a part of the process, but continuing to work for others had some limitations and I was looking to expand and create something that met my expectations. And so mm -hmm. as um, far as a product, you mean? Yes. And okay. a business life, a quality of life that could include what I love doing with the possibility of making good money. And the method of doing that I came to conclude was that we should buy some apartments, fix them up like I'd been doing for years and then help our investors make some money along the way, right? Partner with other people. And we had a couple of friends uh, get together on our first deal. And we brought in a couple of new friends that had some extra capital. And we just ran forward and bought 128 units. And that was the beginning of our uh, adventure together. And I've since done deals with a number of other people. And they all kind of behave in a similar manner. But we're going to talk about more of that today. Okay, good, good. So how long ago was that that you uh, bought that first building? 2018. 2018, wow. So you've created a lot of results in the last short time, right? So your yeah, career was probably 30 years, would you guess? 25, 30 years that you were doing this? 
Yeah, but you're not 15. You're <laughs> could only be 15 years, right? That's correct. <laughs> Since you're 30. <laughs> okay. Um, but yes, been at this a little while. And um, yeah, we're over uh, 530 units now, 532, I think. Mm -hmm. And um, still going, going Very strong. Very cool. Very cool. And your role as, because president is such a, a funny word, right? <laughs> so what is your role in the company or how does your team work uh, to get the deals? Well, we have uh, an acquisitions push, right? We always have to find a deal. Mm -hmm. That is handled often by, uh, we have an associate, Ryan, who works with us and he helps us find deals. Um, you know, I could share a picture of our team, but uh, we've got some diligence We've got property management. We third party property management. So our local talent in that market, wherever we buy is uh, a specialist in that space, but we coordinate with them. And then of course we have to raise money. We have the back office accounting and taxes needed to do. So we use a lot of outsourcing for that as well. So it's a, a lot going on with any project, but the they're larger you get- staff, if I'm hearing you right, they're not all staff there. Um, mm -hmm. Independent contractors, subcontractors, whatever you want. That's to call right. Them. That's right. They're not all staff. You're right. Okay. And that's about scale, right? If, right? if everybody comes in under your roof, your cost of ownership or cost of operation is just too high. Right. Um, right. You can't burden the projects with all that overhead when you're just in that early stage of growth. You need to be able to outsource those tools and those solutions. And I was reading on your website that you're, so you're, you're a value add guy, but you're not, um, which I love because that's what I do, right? Everyone's running one way and I'm the only one looking at apartment buildings, right? So, <laughs> and I, they, they think you're cuckoo, right? Wow, you can make 200% in the stock market. Why are you going after this little building? Because I know it, right? I, I know that business. I don't know how you figure a dot-com's value, right? So, um, so yeah, so you're an, a value add guy, but what I read on your website, what you shared with me is that you're not, there to take the rent from $400 to $800 a month overnight, just because you put slap some paint on it. You have a more, um, I don't want to say humanistic, but that's the best word I can come, come up with. It is a more humane way of yes, improving their, their living quarters, but at the same time, not pushing them out. Like that's what some, some people's business model is to just, you know, if they leave, they leave, whatever, you know, I'm going from 400 to 800 to raise that cap rate and blah, blah, blah. Right. So can you describe what your, your, you know, your target property is or, or the, your business model as it were around the asset? What, what does that look like? You brought up a couple of really key points. Um, the common uh, rehab model is to take an old property take out a lot of the accessories inside, whether that's kitchens or bathrooms or, you know, windows even, and elevate that property by replacing all of that infrastructure, maybe even plumbing and electrical with a full renovation. And that's, we call uh, gentrifying or repositioning that property. So now instead of that property being worth, let's just use round numbers, 100,000, you've done enough work to say that that property is now worth 150,000, maybe 200,000, because of that move of energy and you put a lot of resource into that property, your investment might be 25 grand, but therefore you have an outsized reward. But you can tell that that's valuable to you because you can look next door and find similar product and it was worth taking that fixer upper as the Satan goes mm -hmm. uh, and bringing it up to the market. Well, there's a, where that business model falls into risk and the same is true in apartments, is if you see that same property and your answer is, well, you know, if I put a second story on there, I can get 300,000 because I'm just going to go for it. But you're not, there's a risk in that. If your neighborhood is all $200,000 homes, right? And you were going to elevate it to $200,000 in value, but now because you want to put a third, a second story on it, you want 300,000. You may discover that the market can't bear that expectation of $300,000. Like that expectation. Like right? that. That's the others would call it speculation, right? Cause you're just kind of hoping someone will accept that. Well, the same is true in apartments. Um, if I buy an apartment complex for, and it's like, let's say that on average it's making $600 a month. I know if you're in California, that's like a carport, but that's not true in the rest of the world. 
So let's assume that it's six hundred dollars a month in rent. If the neighbor, the neighboring properties, are seven hundred dollars a month in rent, that shows us a value add opportunity to come up to market. That's seven hundred thousand dollars, right? So we automatically see if we buy this property at six hundred, we're going to make some money by just coming to market. But if we were to say to ourselves, you know what, if we could just go big, we could put granite in this thing and we can change all the cabinets and we can really upgrade and we can put some carports out there and we can really go gangbusters on our renovation. But for that to pencil, we need $900 a month. There's a huge chunk of speculation once again, because the neighboring properties without those benefits are still at 700 and yeah, so how much is that granite worth, right? Is that what you're saying? Right. Like maybe you over-improved it for that neighborhood. Your, your risk is this vast over-improvement and not being able to recapture the rewards that you were speculating for. So take those stories and come back to the way we play. We target that $600 a month property with modest renovations. I would describe them more as restorations. We're fixing roofs. We're fixing lighting. We're fixing the parking lot. We're replacing the mailboxes. We're upgrading. Uh, we're replacing appliances that don't work. We're fixing uh, inherent drainage issues on the property. We're fixing even vacant units that have been vacant so long that the, re- the previous owner couldn't fix them that really they're just an eyesore. Mm-hmm. Right? We're going to fix the property, allowing us to do that much more modestly than a true renovation, which is a big lift. Mm-hmm. We do a very light reno. We'll replace flooring, we'll repaint, we'll do things that are good for long-term ownership, but we're not going to do things that displace all the current residents. So we bring our product up to $700 a month. And now we just look like the neighborhood, except we're the cared for product. We're the ones where everything works. We're the ones where we have two maintenance guys on site instead of none. Mm-hmm. We're, and it's fresh. So you take like fresh, fat and but, drab kind of. And it's been cared for and we're, responsive and where you begin to manage in a different way than most other management companies. And so that's just the difference in strategies for how to invest in a product with great risk or more reduced risk, right? Because if this property has been making money for 30 years, I think it's going to make us money for another 30 years if we treat it right. So that's how we walk into this business. And And you kind of renovate as you go, like if there's tenants already there, are you waiting till they move out or... Do you, do you go to them and say, I know you're living here, but we would like to, you know, freshen up your unit? Like what sequence or what, um, yeah, what's the process for improving the building? That, great question. Um, I've done it both ways. I've probably renovated several thousand units in my previous life. Mm-hmm. And the vacate to renovate is sometimes a good strategy if you're really going for a big renovation. Let's assume you're going to replace electrical and plumbing, right? You can't really replace the plumbing in the first floor when the second floor is dependent on it. Uh So now displacement is necessary. But in a modest renovation, we have the benefit of only renovating on turn, right? On vacancy. So we're getting revenue all along the way. The unit is about to turn, That person's lease is either expiring or they don't want to accept our new rents because, right, we're moving rents. Mm -hmm. So they choose to leave. And Mm -hmm. apartments are inherently um, transient. They're not expecting to stay forever. But that process then allows us to do a quick renovation while we put it back on market at our new rent. And then that new clientele comes in and expects this to be normal oh, this is the new rent. It's a normal unit. It's in very good shape. All of our appliance works, all the light fixtures. It's a great place to be. So that process, unfortunately, it takes a little while, right? We're not able to push rents in three months. We're pushing rents on turn. So that's a year-long process with our year-long leases. But that's the business model. And it also allows you, another benefit is it allows you to work with smaller contractors, right? Now I only need to turn three, five, 10 units a month not 40 units a month, which would force you into a GC kind of model. And now all your costs are elevated. Mm -hmm, So that's some of our approach to the process. Right. And so do you look for a certain unit mix too? Are you looking at, and maybe before I ask that, what markets are you in? I think that would help people understand, you know, the market and the price point, the rent price point that you're in. Sure. Um, Well, 
geographically, right. we're targeting the South, and we typically prefer the Southeast United States. Mm -hmm. um, we're not very gung-ho about the coast. There is a tremendous liability to the coastal properties from an either insurance coast. perspective. You're talking either coast. Well, that, yes, no, you're talking right and left coast, right? Those are a whole different right. bag, of, bag of tricks right there. But I'm thinking of the Gulf Coast, the right? Gulf if you were down, down in Alabama or Louisiana or Mississippi, down on the coast, sometimes you'll find a really great value in property. And what you don't recognize in that value is that they're rebuilding it every year. Right. Well, I just tell people to... don't fight Mother Nature, right? Why would you go somewhere where you're fighting Mother Nature, right? Right. And, you know, some people say, well, I can insure. I, I want to tell you the insurance companies have not become more foolish. They just right. become more expensive. Right. And they're beginning to exclude all kinds of things like wind, hail. And uh, you've got to really watch you gotta really watch what you're buying, even oh, if you think it's a value. Um, yeah. My insurance policies in Florida are are a, are a heartache, pain point discussion for another day. But believe me, it's not pretty. That's a two hour call right there. Yeah, we've gone through some amazing roller coasters in the last couple of years. I but, bet. Um, so yeah, we target that area because what we're finding geographically is that the the world, you know, Northern America, is noticing that it's always sunny in the South. And they don't need to freeze anymore. Yeah. And so there's a, there's a mass population move to the south, including employers who aren't being disrupted by those same storms, mm -hmm. whether it's delivery of materials or traffic or, you know, the trucks aren't running anymore and they can't get their product out. So they're moving their manufacturing down to the south as well. The land is still cheap. The employment is still inexpensive and it's dependable, which is really key in today's markets where we've all re we've all experienced those interruptions. Right. They just. It's been frustrating, to say the least. So we like that market. Now, I want to go a little more detailed. And when we play in markets, we play in our group as elected to play in markets over 300,000 people. It doesn't have to be what they call gateway markets. I don't need to play in Dallas and Nashville and you know, the major names of cities you would remember and know, I'm willing to go to uh, Knoxville, Tennessee. I'm willing to go to Huntsville, right? These secondary markets. Mm -hmm. I, I like those markets. We like those markets because they are, they're still opportunities. Right. We'll even go to the suburbs of those markets. Now, you may look at this individual city and go, ooh, there's only 100,000 people there. Mm -hmm. But in the MSA, they're grafted into that smaller market. Right. And that's okay. And how much of a driving distance would you call that acceptable for your, for your uh, model? Like within well, 30 minutes driving or? Uh, from a major airport? Right. Or from this. Because as, the as a group, MSA maybe. Uh -huh. right. As a group, I'm in a, I'm in, we reside in California. We just happen to buy elsewhere. Right. But so all of our properties are a flight or two away, mm -hmm. but from an MS, from a major airport, I would say that it's funny here in California, we talk about going to LA as, Oh, that's a two hour drive. We don't talk in miles. Right. Because we're just sitting in traffic. Right. Uh, when it's pretty interesting when you get out, um, out of state and you start to travel you'll find that you'll hit some cities and in 10 minutes you're in the country. Mm -hmm. It's pretty it remarkable, amazing. right? 10 miles is a, seems like nothing to them, to us, it's an hour in the mm -hmm. wrong part of town. Right. So um, yeah, you want to be able to stay in an area. Well, I can help refine that a little bit. Remember that some communities are rather new in their development, new in their expansion. Mm. Their ability to provide my product type, let's say we always target over 100 units. I'd be willing to talk more about that in a second. Mm -hmm. But because we want old apartments, over 100 units, we have to target cities that have been around long enough to have an inventory of that, right? And you're not, not looking for, you know, not, uh, the year 2000 built properties, right? There's also an right. age that you tar target. That's um, right. We, what what? Uh, year or what age building do you target 
We target uh, basically 1970s to 1980s product. It's considered a C class product. Mm -hmm. And the reason why is because it's a major cash flow asset. Right. Um, we're covering a lot of bases, but our investment objective is cash flow for our investors. We are not trying to get on a magazine. We're not trying to make the news. We're not trying to, that's not our objective to pick something pretty. We want and take that at a very low return. We want to find products that provide great cash flow and great returns to our investors. Mm-hmm. And the higher and the newer product you go to and the larger product, right? If we go to 400 units in 2010, that's going to draw the, uh, the large institutional investor groups. And they're going to have so much capital and such inexpensive capital that they will pay way too much for that property from a business perspective. And for those of those of us, you know, those in your audience who understand cap rates, right? That's the return on your investment. If you pay cash, they're willing to accept very small returns, sometimes three and 4% of a return as if they paid cash for that property. Now they make some of it up with leverage, but, that's getting pretty detailed. Um, keep just needless to say, when you start shopping in our space, we are not facing institutional investors. We're facing fellow investors. Mm-hmm. And most of the time, because we're targeting over a hundred units, we have a very small window of competition. Right. We're so it's not the of, small mom and pop, right? It's not the right. beginning investor or even, you know, like, would I put all my money in one building? I might, but I, you know, so I, I might, I'm not the mom and pop. So I'm like in between, but I'm also not that hundred unit, right? So you've got a certain particular kind of person who can compete against you to buy that product, right? And right, it's pretty right. thin. It's a pretty yep. thin crowd. So that you brought is- up a really good segment description, right? A single family, an individual, uh, maybe a husband and wife will buy a single family home and rent it and fix it up and do whatever they do with that. But it might be a stretch for them to get into a fourplex. Right. But maybe a, a doctor or somebody who's been doing it for a while and they're slipping out of another property, they're going to jump to a right. fourplex. Someone who can exchange might buy a little bigger. You might get a couple of doctors or, you know, white collar professionals have this excess retirement fund that they want to capitalize into real estate. And then maybe they're going to chase a 10 or 12 or 20 unit property. But when you step above 100 units, right, our goal is to target above 100 units. And um, we typically, I would say it's 100 to 300 is our window to be competitive. Of the unit count? Of unit count. As soon as we start to get above 300, even 250, we start to see a new version of institutional investor who's coming into our space. Mm -hmm. Um, But when we stay low, right, our dollar value per transaction is under 10 million, let's say. Mm-hmm. If you guys and those on the coasts might chuckle at the idea that we could buy a hundred units for $10 million. Right. But Your price per door is very low in other places. <laughs> our price per door is remarkably approachable, but because we're doing so many doors, now we're still, again, we're still a unique buyer in that market. And we want distressed sellers. We want a, a seller who's, We're going to run into these all the time. They're unsophisticated. They're moms and pops. They're grandpas who's had this property their whole time. And now it's transitioning to the next generation. Next generation throws their hands up and go, I don't know what to do with that. I don't want that. Or they try for a bit and they kind of run it into the ground a little bit, right? The mismanagement, mismanagement of the managers, whatever you want to call it. So are those, what what other. That is our opportunity for sure. Yeah. So what are their distress points? Were those kind of the main ones there? Um there's a lot of self-managed product. So they're not leaning on the expertise of someone else because they believe if they save that percentage of fee, Mm -hmm. that's a common one. Yeah. They can live on that, but they lose the expertise or the market savvy to understand that markets have moved and they haven't moved rents or their vacancies are taking longer than they should. And so their cash flow is falling off Mm -hmm. because when cash flow falls off of a family who's living off that revenue, they don't have the money to turn another unit right. or to fix that unit that got vandalized by the last tenant who left. 
And so now it sits vacant. And now that's a revenue drain. Mm-hmm. They're never going to get that potential back, right? So it's not uncommon for us to take over a property that's 20% vacant because they've gone through that slide where their rents aren't high enough to justify reinvesting. Mm -hmm. And now they've lost so much occupancy that they're creeping in on their loan margin. And even the lenders start to yell at them, Hey, you don't have any cushion. That's the thing is, well, unless they have it free and clear, but if they have a loan, most lenders will ask you for an update on your financials for that building every single year. Every and quarter so sometimes. Don't realize, yeah, people don't realize that um, in your loan papers, it says that if you let the building decline, they can call the note. This is a serious, no joke situation, you know? So, yeah, you know, winging it yourself is kind of a bad idea, right? <laughs> so we have another question about, do you target a certain return? And that kind of brings me to my question of, you know, the entrance cap rate versus exit cap rate. Like, how do you... Sometimes it's okay to take a lower cap rate going in uh, if you justify it with, like for me, I kind of figure it takes 18 months to stabilize, you know, to clean out and stabilize and all that. Um, Florida, notwithstanding, pain point. Okay. <laughs> Sorry, this, did I forget to tell you this is also Athena's therapy session? <laughs> I see, I see a, a little venting. So, um, so what's your thoughts around the, the entrance cap rate? What do you target for your, cause you have investors to answer to, why don't you, uh, kind of share that with us a little bit? Well, uh, the cap rate discussion, uh, I want to summarize it really quickly. The cap rate, the term cap rate assumes that if you put a hundred thousand dollars into your investment, you pay cash, your return on investment if it's an eight cap, we'll give you an 8% return. If it's a six cap, it'll only give you a 6% return, right? So some people cap rate is bantered about and it's not very, um, I don't want to lose anybody in that. Mm-hmm. So what will happen is when you come in with a million dollars, if you're getting an eight cap, you're hoping to get $80,000 a year in profit. That's after operating expenses, NOI, right? Net operating expenses. It doesn't include debt. So what we're targeting as we're purchasing property is we have to clarify what they're actually making. This is a very key purchasing consideration. We're buying actual revenue. We're buying a money printing tree. If that tree is withered, it's missing a few limbs, it hasn't been watered, We're still buying that dilapidated tree. We're not buying pro forma tree. We're not buying the broker's imagination of what that will be worth someday. If we do it all the broker's way, we're buying what they're producing. So that's a very key conversation. And it plays right into Athena's comment about cap rate, right? If we pay too much, there's not enough return here. So we have to come back down and buy what they're selling. Now, we may give some consideration for blue sky or future value. Let's say we're looking at a property that's 50% occupied. And let's say they're getting $1,000 a door at 50% occupancy. And that's just great. But that's what we're buying. Now, we know we're going to get another 50% of units given to us to improve. There should be some consideration for the fact that those assets do exist in whatever condition they are. That's your property inspection. Mm -hmm. Some are going to take a light renovation. Uh, Oh, that thing needs paint and carpet. Turn it right back on. Others are going to be, whoa, that thing caught fire. (laughs) We got to do a lot of work in there. And that might have affected four other units. So that's a whole, right? That's a whole level of professionalism or proficiency needed to identify. But ideally, you're buying cash flow. And we will buy products with a very meager cap rate, knowing that after we've owned it a year, we're going to do X. If I were to define that in very general terms, um, we are not able to buy product at an eight cap rate at acquisition when they're distressed. We're typically acquiring a property around a five or a six in a cap rate value 
because on its as is income right then because and of its as is income we still see the value we we actually know the value of its future after we reinvest let's say we're going to buy something for 5 million but it's going to take 2 million from us to turn it around right well then our basis or our purchase price is going to be 7 million dollars for that thing in our head mm-hmm. we're not giving it all to our to the seller but we're still going to come out of pocket with that cash mm-hmm. so but once we do that, we're going to gain the extra revenue. And that's the win, right? That's where we all look around at each other and go, oh, this is going to be a good one. Mm-hmm. And when we underwrite, we underwrite with the idea that we're going to turn a property in a year. It would have to be an extraordinary. It'd be extraordinary if, or 18 months, it'd be extraordinary if we said it'll take a full two years. That'd be, that'd be in really bad condition. Mm-hmm. But it's in the right market. And then, um, so our underwriting presumes that we're going to get a certain amount of cash flow over time that spins off out of profits and a certain valuation creep or increase because of NOI, net operating income increase, Mm -hmm. so that we can justify a future value at sale. In our business model, we're targeting about a five-year sale and our underwriting criteria is that we're targeting about a 20% annualized rate of return for our investors. It's not guaranteed. Mm -hmm. It's a business decision to underwrite with that kind of return. And for those of you that, you know, have got a lot of sophistication, you're nodding your heads and understanding and other people are going, what? You're out of your mind, right? If things don't go as planned and we struggle to attain that underwriting, oh, we might get a 16% return or an 18% return. But nobody shakes their head as that is a bad return. Right. But if we underwrite at 12 or 14% and then we have a problem, ouch, right? We just lose that cushion. But on the other hand, because of the way the markets have moved recently, even our underwriting has seemed conservative because rents are going skyrocketing all over the place. Right. So you can, can you walk you walk us through that that math or that concept again of the purchase at five million and the I think Vera would like to hear kind of that flow again or that how that works again. Um, so your well, purchase was five million and then you did at purchase maybe you have a cap rate of five or six but you're going to improve it and let's say it takes between a year and eighteen months then your ending cap rate that you're aiming for aiming for is a certain amount right. Sure. Well, um, based on your underwriting, I mean, things can. So our, um, I want to explain that our exit price is based on a cap rate as well, right? Mm-hmm. It's based on the net operating income by an interest rate, by an eight eight percent eight cap or a seven cap, right? And that creates a valuation in the future. Mm-hmm. Um, it's probably um, be a little simpler to explain. Let me let me share a screen, if I may. Okay. Um, I'll jump into. That our, would be great. I'll jump into a, an example we have on our website. Let me know when that works for you. Okay, it just came up. All right. So while everybody can wander around our business. This is uh, as transparent as we're allowed to be by our attorney. Um, under investing, we have, of course, how we do our business, right? We're targeting buying, then inv- having investors join us, and then we collect rent and we help investors get paid. But here's a sample opportunity. So um, this is the way the properties perform, this is only the performance side. This isn't the profit and loss statement. This is our investor side of the picture, which most people are raising their hands, trying to understand how much money will will I make if I give it to you? Right. Right. (laughs) Very good way of saying it. (laughs) And so this is a really fair way to look at it. We're going to raise... Two, oh, let's call it two and a half million dollars for this property. 
we actually have raised this much money, 205, 200, excuse me, 2.5 million for that property. The annual cash flow for that same property at this time, at his first year was only $200,000. But as we return that to our investors, so that they're starting to get a return on their investment, right? So they're going to see about a seven or almost an 8% return that first year. Mm -hmm. But the second year, cash flow continues to grow. And by the third year, and we, we Looks begin like to- you gave them back some money there. And right, because in this model, we had a refinance and we returned some capital to the investors. So the overall account balance drops- but the revenue still the revenue, and now we're of course we have a greater loan. But with the greater loan, we have a greater loan payment. But we still continue to cash flow our investors, mm -hmm. and this is their return on investment because of course they've got their cash back to invest in something else. Mm -hmm. But the major win, of course, is when we sell and we return the rest of investor capital. We get the profits from sale, and our total investor return right? After their return of capital. So that 200, that 2.5 million comes back at 2.9 million over its five-year lifespan. So this and is what how, rent increase. So this is your pro forma into your four or five. I don't know what building this is or how long you've had it, but yeah, this is a, this is a 200 year project. Okay. So, um, so that's assuming what kind of rent increase. Um, well, each property is different, but on mm -hmm. average, that's about a 20% rent increase uh, in the first uh, two years, and then a 5% rent increase after that. Okay. So you raise it slow in the beginning and more as you go forward? Correct. Because, well, we raise it quickly in the beginning, and it slows down in the behind, right? So if we're going to raise rents about 20% in the first two years, it's because we've done all our improvements and we've improved the property to a way that we know we can invite residents and they will stay or they will invite their friends. Mm -hmm. um, That's right. You said a 20% increase for a couple of years and then 5%. Right. And then it, it slows down to- My brain told we, me 2%. Sorry about we, that. <laughs> <laughs> we actually underwrite 3% rent increases after okay. all of our work. Um, that's kind of a national norm. Um, we're not, we don't hold to the 5% year after year after that. Yeah. Cause a lot of people ask me that for some reason, how much should I assume that my rents will go up in the future? And yeah, it's a tricky question. It's, and it's market-based I think. Right. And no one knew we'd go through what we're going through now. Right. So precisely right. That, mm -hmm. that phenomenon of uh, what we're doing now should not be presumed to race on into the future. A matter of fact, our underwriting didn't include any of what we're experiencing from a market perspective. Mm -hmm. That's part of why our returns have become enhanced because our underwriting only assumed that we would take that 600 unit, $600 a unit product mm -hmm. to $700, right? That's a 20% increase in rent, give or take. And, mm -hmm. When we talk about that move to 700, well, now we know, okay, we're going to get 725 the following year, right? We're going to start moving that. Right. And then your increases up. are based on the previous more than expected increase. So it's, it's a snowball effect. It's a snowball effect, right? And mm -hmm. if we can raise $10 on 100 units, right, that's $1,000 more income per month, excuse me, no, it's $10,000 more. <laughs> no, it gets tricky. It's, funny. it's funny having these conversations and going I know, and then your forth. brain doesn't do the math anymore. <laughs> back and forth. But when we move rents like that, right, we're seeing such a dramatic increase in cash flow because our expenses remain predictable, unless you're talking insurance. And then, right. And then um, because of that, while rents are moving, that all drops down to NOI. Mm -hmm. And that operating income is what we're going to sell to a future investor, right? Because they're going to buy cash flow. 
They're going to buy a stabilized asset, 95% occupancy, an asset that they can anticipate keeping for the next 15 years. And it'll continue to make money as long as they manage it well. Mm -hmm. That's what most investors want, right? Because it takes a level of sophistication to reposition an asset from its rough state Mm -hmm. to in its restored state. Right. And it's very dramatic in the product that you're doing, as opposed to some people think that their value add when they take something, just put paint on it and raise the rent a little bit. That's not value add. And that they're not going to see a great increase in, in uh, cash flow if they if they just take this, this somewhat sad looking. That's not going to work. Right. And people think they because rents are going up so fast, they think they can do it. Which kind well, of brings me to a question that Vera has. So it, I think we need to clarify underwriting. So as a mortgage, I was a mortgage under, I was an FHA underwriter, right? So I make sure that the loan, the papers someone provides, you know, fits within the guidelines of whatever loan program I'm underwriting, right? So there's rules sure. and I'm making sure the person fits the rules. When we talk about underwriting uh, a multifamily, it's, it's similar, but it's different in the sense that you're not just looking at the loan, although that is a driver for getting financing is a driver. But can you explain to us what what do you what is what encompasses underwriting from your point of view as a as an investor or a syndicator? What what's underwriting to you? How, what's the process or what what's involved in underwriting the building? Wow, that's a really broad question, mm-hmm. but I will talk about I'll try and stay out of the weeds. Okay. Um, or what certain categories are you looking at that, it, that would be so included in underwriting? The condition of the asset, what you're buying, right, is always key, but the condition of the asset, how much money do you have to put into it? What is the market? What's the neighboring market support? Um, the potential in that market to maintain itself or grow Right? Are jobs coming into that market? Um, are we? Are there any constraints to development? Right? Is the cost of construction so high that no one will ever compete with us? Right? In our product type, they could bring new. That. You mean from the ground up building versus that's right new construction. Existing. Okay, right. Right. Um, there's a lot of right. There's outside influences, and then there's the things that we can manage, mm-hmm. and the principles of our underwriting are to be as clear as possible about our current condition, what's going really going on in the market, what rents really are today, Mm -hmm. like for like product. It's really convenient when the same era 1975 product is built across the street and they're getting more rent than we are. You have to raise your hand and go, what, right? What did they do? And if they did some improvement to the property, can we do that? Because if we can, we can match rents. Right. That's not a very big reach, even though currently the property is not making that kind of money. Right. So you got so, your rental comps. Right. You've your got comps, your condition. Your condition market comparables. Building, money needed right. to fix it. That's right. So underwriting to me is almost the opposite from lending underwriting. You're putting the puzzle together, whereas we as mortgage underwriters are taking it apart. We're taking the file apart. You're actually putting, you're gathering data on condition of the property, cost to fix it, rental comps, um, political influences. And I don't mean, you know, the parties. I mean, you know, what's going on politically in that market that might affect the viability of your investment, right? Right. So, some municipalities are very growth oriented, right? They're making, they're streamlining the ability for industry to come into their town. And some municipalities push back. They don't even want to, you know, we've got them here in California. We've got municipalities that won't allow a McDonald's into their town. Right. That's not our culture. We don't want that here. That's a very interesting approach. It's very stifling to growth. Mm. So in, in the markets you're searching for, you need to understand the overall market's health because the stronger that market is, the more pressure there is for housing, right? We've experienced it in many of the communities we live in. Housing is a very fixed, defined thing. And as people keep coming, there's a strain or a stress put on that. Um, But so, yes, a lender underwrites to today. What is that property doing today? We don't really care about the future. Can we guarantee we're going to get our money back? 
In fact, they're looking at yesterday and last year to see what happened last year so they can extrapolate into the future, which is the today future. Exactly. Yeah, we want to hear your pie in the sky about next year, right? <laughs> we're in the middle of a refinance, so they asked for three years of records. And I was shocked. But they loved the story of where we started, and they wanted to understand why our purchase price had, was so reduced compared to our new appraisal, right? We saw such a significant right. move in appraisal. They raised their hand and go, how's that possible? Right. Well, because we we'll call it suspicion. <laughs> That's right. That's what, or anxiety. that's what underwriters are trained to do is be suspicious about everything. That's just right. So, you know. but, <laughs> so when we're underwriting, right, underwriting, the language of underwriting for an acquisition or a, an investor is to identify what are they actually buying today and then what are the prospects of its future. And sometimes we're looking to buy a piece of land, but we're going to build this on it. And it's going to take us three years, but in three years, we're going to make that much money. It's going to be fantastic. I view that as quite a bit of risk, speculative assumptions along the way. Yeah. One could be three years is a long time. One could be it'll take three years. Another could be it takes five years. The city didn't give me permits or I think it's going to cost $100 to construct and it cost me $125 to construct. Ouch. Right. These surprises along the way really impact you when you have a lot of variables. If you can reduce those variables, you can have a much more predictable outcome. So we're buying an existing property. We don't need permits. We're buying a cash flow that the owner is selling today. We now know what revenue this property does generate. And then we look across the street and we go, we can get what they're getting. So now we can compare ourselves to like product and know that we don't have any downtime except for our renovation to bring it into that space. I would be very leery to do exactly our business, but then say, well, instead of $700 a month, we're gonna get 900 or $1,000 a month because we replaced the windows. I'd be cautious of that because it doesn't look like that market will support a $900 a unit. Mm -hmm. If you're gonna pay $900 a unit, would you live there in that community or would you live in a different community, right? Yeah. Um, and that brings us to the difference between workforce housing that we buy and all workforce housing. Workforce housing is a language of affordable uh, market rate housing. Uh, there is a municipal or a government affordable housing model, but we don't play in that. We play in the retail or naturally occurring affordable. And then there's different market spaces, different communities. We won't shop in a community that's in tremendous distress. We'll shop in a community that's just remote surrounded by homes in what they call working class community. It just happens to be the old apartment in that community that's causing the neighbor's frustration because nobody cares, right? We move into that neighborhood, fix it up, and now our neighbors celebrate. They're already caring about their neighborhood. We're just fixing this eyesore. The blight, yeah. Compared to we make our property nice in a very rough part of town, and now we're actually the target because we look nicer than everybody else. Yeah, that is not a good business model for creating value. Right. Right. And so so we don't target that. We that's we consider that the market calls that a D neighborhood. We don't shop in D neighborhoods. We only shop in C and B neighborhoods. And that's part of our business strategy of protecting our investors. Just an ex just some summaries uh, of things we've talked about today. Okay, great. Um, so we had a question about, uh, and I'm going to let you get to the syndication 101, just explaining what it is. But, <laughs> but before we do that is, um, uh, let's see here. Um, so there were one, one question about where you get your deals. You know, are you uh, looking on the MLS, the LoopNet, the Crexy, the whatever, or is it all off market or where, where do you tend to see the deals? And, and actually to, to kind of pin another one on there. How many deals would you say you look at per week or per month? If, is, if there's a flow, it, just kind of the deal making or finding the deals, Where do, how does that happen? Sure. Um, we have found that deal quantity is a big part of finding a value. There's a lot of deals. There's not a lot of deals where value is easily found. So we could go through 20 or 30 deals before we even write an LOI or a letter of intent. 
showing our interest in buying that property. But of our LOIs, we're also offering our price. So we may be looking at a $10 million property, but after we do our numbers and we, instead of the pro forma number of a $10 million property, we see what they're actually performing on and their P and L their profit and loss. So we're only going to charge, we're only going to offer them eight, five, but if we can get it for eight, five, we can make our business model work. That may preclude us from getting the deal, but we'll send an LOI. Mm -hmm. We'll make our offer available. Some people push back from the table and think we're crazy. Right. Um, the really surprising part is after a couple of months, the phone rings and they call us and they go, you know, we fell out escrow or yeah, it hasn't worked out the way we thought it would. Are you guys still interested? Right. That's a fascinating part of this business. Uh, let's say that somebody wants, somebody else agreed to pay 10 million for that. They take it to their lender. They get their appraiser involved and the appraiser goes, whoa, 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 you're out of your mind. And the lender goes, yeah, I'm not financing that. Well, now the, the market, despite its appetite to buy it at 10 million, can't support that unless you're paying cash. So there is a check and balance in the space. But right now there's a big inflation of value based on expectation and a lot of capital coming into the market. Mm. But so we look at a lot of deals. Um, we... Share with me a couple of, remind me again of a couple of your questions. I don't want to get too far afield. Um, so, so that was, oh yeah, where to find, so do you get a lot okay, of where to find deals. deals or where to find just deals? go to the MLS? <laughs> well, the MLS, uh, LoopNet, when you get into commercial space, you're also talking CoStar, right? That's kind of a contracted service that we use to help us evaluate properties. It does help us find off-market deals because we can look at existing properties that are not for sale, but we can understand from the transparency of the industry what they're getting for rents. So if their rents are depressed or their occupancy is depressed, they become a candidate for us to knock on the door and say, hey, would you guys like to sell? Um, I would say the majority of our deals, because of the way the market is today, are off market that we're interested in. On market deals are typically being they're being seen by a lot of people. The phenomenon of volume of interest has to do with how transparent they are with the information. Most acquisitions groups and most humans in nature are rather uh, easiest path to find a deal is where they spend their time, but the space with the most value comes from off market and off market means we're talking directly to sellers. We're talking direct or directly well, to owners who aren't really for sale a lot, right? They're, they don't even know. They didn't even know they were for sale. Right. Or they thought they were for sale. They thought they'd be for sale next spring, but they got a call from us. Right. Um, we get a lot of leads from property managers, right? Cause we're always looking for property management solutions in each of these markets. Right. And as we're talking property managers, we also, while we're interviewing them for a role of managing our future properties, we also ask them if they have any distressed owners, any troubled properties that might be up or owners that have concluded they just want to change markets. Mm -hmm. They want to move out of multifamily and they want to start buying RV parks or maybe they want to get into medical office. You never know. Everybody's got a different business plan. Mm -hmm. um, those have always been really great entrees for us because now we've got uh, an introduction to an owner. Now we've got easy access to the financials. We understand exactly what we're trading on. Those are really great examples of how to find deals off market. Okay, great. So um, a couple of my questions have to do with the actual structure of syndication. So can you just describe to us what is syndication? You know, people hear the word LLC, REITs, ticks. So just to clarify, what is a syndication? And one of my questions, and I think Jason here had a similar one, is how many uh, investors is ideal? I've had clients who invested in ticks that had 100 people in it, and it was just a chaotic mess, especially when things go wrong. So, so my, my, I guess my question is, do you find there's an ideal number of investors? For me, it would be fewer, just 
my instinct says I, I want fewer people in my in my playground. <laughs> but but um, but what what's first of all, the syndication and then kind of what what do you think is ideal as the number of investors you would take on? Absolutely. Um, uh, the fewer investors, the simpler the transaction. Um, so a syndication is a term used by the SEC, uh, the federal government, to organize a transaction in a way that uh, the law has structured over time to be transparent enough, uh, to provide enough explanation so that the investor can review the investment memorandum or the offering memorandum, this document provided by a group like us, a syndication group. And in that process, in the syndication world, there are ingredients that are necessary for us to provide for transparency, for, uh, for legal reasons, right? That's we might say disclosures or... Disclosures and even the uh, what if pages, right? Oh, well, if the sky falls, this could happen, right? These kind of explanations of these what ifs are really important for the investing community to understand. Uh, if you and your neighbor get involved in a transaction, you call that a partnership. You know what each other's doing. You know what each other's role is because it's just you and your neighbor. But as it grows and becomes more sophisticated, uh, my role as a sponsor or as a deal finder is obliged to do X, Y, and Z. Well, that gets all spelled out in a very formal operating agreement, for instance. Or the, the role of our uh, parties that handle financing or even the process of capital raising, right? All of that's very structured and organized in an SEC compliant document. And so a syndication provides that platform for us to bring friends and family together to buy a property where everybody knows what everybody's role is and how it'll play when we're going to refinance, why we would refinance, how we'll deal with legal issues, how we'll deal with tax issues, right? Those are all kind of spelled out in these operating documents because there really is a level of formality offered. Um, it also includes, for instance, how we handle money. So there's no gray areas or uh, blending of funds between properties because every property sits in its own silo and they're by design insulated. So if one property is really struggling or has a, a detrimental outcome, it doesn't affect others. So that's the benefit of syndication and the strength of syndication, right? Is this isolation. You get to look at the address you're, you're investing in. You get to drive it if you want. You can, you're getting reports on that property all the time. How's it doing in occupancy? How's it doing in performance overall? What are expenses, right? We do quarterly reports in that regard. Um, whereas the next, right, there's other levels of investor. You mentioned TIC, that's tenants in common, often nowadays called a Delaware uh, transaction. And so those, there are a variety of different methods to invest and each becomes more and more formal. Mm. A TIC, tenants in common, implies that you actually own some piece of that real estate. There are tax advantages to that. There are disadvantages to that. Uh, in a syndication, you own membership in an entity, an LLC, and that LLC buys that property. Well, that's what provides you all the insulation from a legal perspective that says if someone goes haywire on that property, the entity that bought that property is taking the brunt of that issue, not the parties that came to play. So we can give insulation to investors you're never worried about someone coming behind or through that barrier and putting their hand in your pocket again, right? That's that isolation a lot of investors really like. We tend, because of our syndication style, our minimum investment is $50,000. Well, when you're trying to raise $2 million, that could be quite a few people. But what we're finding is the more sophisticated investors like playing in this syndication space because of the boundaries and the rules provided by the SEC. So we've got investors at $150,000, uh, pretty commonly because they just want to be in real estate. They want to be direct to real estate. So they know which address they're shopping in and they know where their money is mm -hmm. compared to 
blind pool funds where someone comes along and says, hey, give me your money. We invest in real estate and we take money from everybody and we put in a big bucket uh-huh. and then we take pieces of it and we doll it out over these other properties. Now, you'll never know what property you're in, but trust us, uh-huh. we're investing it properly. Yeah. <laughs> it, it requires a lot more faith to invest in a blind pool uh-huh. because now you're just assuming it's all turning out well versus investing directly in a property. Mm-hmm. You get more direct response and clarity on the way the property is performing. And so those are some of the subtleties of the different methods of investing your own money. So do you um, get a 1099 or a K1 with that with a syndication investment? The annual tax documents for the investors is a K1. Okay. So so because it's an LLC and we're not CPAs, but I'm guessing based on my tax returns that don't laugh. <laughs> I'm just, you know, um, so it sounds like that this is going to be a pass through that we're going to get if there's a negative, hopefully there's never a negative, but through depreciation and what have you, there might be a negative that we get to benefit from our tax returns? Well, you do get the revenue, right? Uh-huh. We're sharing in revenue on the product, but then you also get the depreciation. That's another advantage of investing directly in an asset. Right. You get to benefit from that depreciation. Many other investment solutions don't share in that depreciation. The mm-hmm. depreciation stays within our organization and we use it to our advantage. But right. uh, to the, uh, we'll call it newer investor, the real advantage of being in real estate is that uh, I'll give you an example. We're uh, generating $19,000 a month in depreciation on one property that offsets income generated from that property and return to you in a tax friendly way. So you can talk to your accountants about depreciation, but it is a magic of real estate. One of the one of the magic wands of real estate. Okay, so um, let's see. So Jason has a couple of questions. I'm just going to try and uh, go through here. Please. Um, okay. Well, this is a quick one. Do you have any experience uh, syndicating other commercial real estate or just uh, multifamily apartment buildings? Just multifamily. Okay. That's my. That's where we specialize. But a syndication in general is very consistent structurally. The component, the ingredient of what they're trading, whether it's medical office or uh, mobile homes, right, is the only variable. So now you really need to be asset specific, but the syndication should be very similar from door to door. Okay, and then there's two two couple of questions here about returns and, and I think it's helpful uh, for the language, for people to learn the language. So uh, Jason wanted to know about, um, do you normal normally offer preferred returns? And then the second question about returns is, do you normally have any waterfall of returns? Great questions. Um, and just what does that even mean, right? I think right. that would be helpful for people. Right. To so know uh, what uh, it means. the first term used was preferred return. A preferred return implies that before any monies are shared, there's this preferred place in revenue. And the investors in past deals, for instance, we have an 8% pref, 8% preferred return. The investor will make 8% before any other monies are shared. That's a great example of the use of that term. We do offer a pref in those other projects. 8% was the pref on two properties, most recent properties we did. And then they share an ownership so besides meeting their PREF, they also will grow and share in revenue along the way. The- Correct me if I'm, I'm wrong, but I kind of view it when I do a preferred return deal, I kind of view it more like I'm almost like the lender because I'm guaranteed a certain return or, you know, I'm first on the list. So if you're a bondholder versus a shareholder in Coca-Cola or any kind of company, that that's the mindset, right? Is that you're... At the top of the list, should something go wrong, right? Uh, that's a really, that good, clarif- kind of that's a really good clarification. Um, I know a number of formal organizations view a PREF as the cap on earnings, 
but it's also the minimum earnings. So you're, you act almost like a real lender. Mm -hmm. That's how I feel about it. Not as a participant overall. Now, some will say I want an eight pref with a 12 cap, Mm -hmm. right? We're starting to use buzz phrases here, but what they're saying is (laughs) if the property goes gangbusters, I'm only going to get 12% return. I accept that, but I want a guarantee that I won't get less than eight. Of course, there's never a guarantee, but right. they will get eight before I see any money, right? That's what that pref means. Right. That includes like the the syndicator sponsor does not get like we'll call it the management fee or the organizing fee. Right. You're right. saying I'm going to pay you before I pay me, right? Right. I mean the the fees needed to keep the lights on right. are obviously a base <laughs> expense of operation, but the but the profits shared, right? I can't share in profits until they meet their return. So that's one way of pref is just, those are a couple of different ways pref is described. And then the other question or the other part of the question was waterfall. Waterfall is a term where after the property is performed to a certain level, there is a change in the way returns are calculated. So if we were to say you have a waterfall at 20%, that means once you, the property performs and you're receiving as an investor, 20% on your money, the waterfall may now kick in and it may say that instead of a straight shot of all profits because of your percentage of ownership, it may say you're going to be capped out at 20% or your escalation from that point on will be more modest because we've as an exec, as a sponsor and as the uh, general partners versus the limited partners, right? Our limited partners are always cared for first. The general partners can benefit greatly if our property is a huge home run with a waterfall model because the waterfall tends to put a lid or a ceiling on what our limited partners benefit from. But if the benefit on our limited partners is so successful, there's largely, or there's rarely, excuse me, rarely any pushback to the idea of a waterfall. But in uh, many of our early projects, we didn't have a waterfall. So our investors are seeing some remarkable benefit from the growth. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Okay. And um, Sherry would like to know uh, uh, how often the returns are distributed. Uh, we target quarterly returns, right? When you buy a property that's, uh, we talked earlier about buying properties that might be 50% occupied. There may be a deferment of return, right? We won't make distributions while it's not cash flowing, mm-hmm. but um there's always the intent to distribute quarterly and we would uh, make ups or um, being able to distribute additional capital for any deferred returns is always a priority to get our investors back on track. Mm-hmm. And that could be because cash flow just continues to grow and we just keep piling cash in. It can be from a financial event like a refi where we get some capital back. That can replenish any deferments. Um, every because we're dealing in real estate, every one of them, every project is entirely different. They are similar in many ways, but each property's performance and the asset and the condition we find it, I've never found two alike. Mm-hmm. Right. So each business plan will require that kind of transparency. Well, we'll, we'll explain. Look, we're buying this great asset. It's got this great return, but we're not going to make distributions for the first year. You're right. We just tell everybody up front mm-hmm. it's part of the business plan. Mm-hmm. So just cycling back to the, to the refinance, I almost feel like when you're a value add guy or gal guy, um, you know, you almost expect, I got you laughing all the time. <laughs> I just, anyway. So when you're, when you're a value add, you almost expect that, that the refinance is built into the plan because either and, and make, share with me on, on, on your experience that, you know, you're probably going in with not the best financing because the asset didn't qualify or, or, or could not get, um, say, Fannie Mae financing, right? So That's right. you have to go in with not hard money, but quasi hard money, private invest or whatever, right? Maybe you're paying seven, eight percent on the mortgage. So you've got to refinance it quickly to get that 3.2 or whatever. So um so it's almost like if you're buying value add, you you have in your plan to refinance. So are you targeting that you're going to refinance cash out all the time? 
or do you think it's better to just keep the debt low and not give the investors any cash back? What's your, how, how is your business model around that topic? Um, our business, so you are correct. Our initial loan is what they call a bridge loan. And it's short term by nature. It's typically uh, two years with a one year extension, uh, six to 8%. But the advantage is that we're getting an 80% loan to value in its current state, right? Our purchase price. Awesome. (laughs) Right? Which, what industries allow you to do that? Yeah. But they also give us 100% of our renovation money. They don't give it to us up front. They make us earn it. But every time we keep investing into the property and give them receipts, they go ahead and reimburse us. So all the while we're raising- Am I understanding that right? They're, t- they're maybe giving you a, a certain loan amount and then increasing the loan amount? Or did they give you a big loan amount, set that money aside in an escrow account and dole it out like a construction loan? They set it aside like a construction okay. loan. So okay. let's say that we're buying a $5 million property with a million dollars of improvement. Well, we're going to get a 80% loan to value, right? We're going to get a $4 million loan for that $5 million property. But they're going to give us another million dollar loan. We're going to have a first and a second effectively. Okay. Okay. But what's really happening is when we buy the property, we are now going, we also have to have enough cash to invest, improve that property. And then we go to the bank and say, can I be reimbursed? And then the bank cuts us a check. Mm -hmm. I'm simplifying this a lot, Mm -hmm. but they'll cut us a check to allow us to keep going on that renovation. And the renovation all the while is raising the valuation of the property, right? Because the, appraiser says, well, yeah, it's a $5 million property when they bought it, but if through their renovations, I think it's going to be worth seven or eight, right? That makes the lender completely content with the idea that they're going to give us $5 million to do the improvements when, when we're done, we're going to have an $8 million property, right? They're still protected along the way, right? Every lender wants to be protected from everything. Mm -hmm. Yep. So (laughs) that's why we're suspicious of everything. (laughs) That's right. So that is the the nature of the purchase loan. And then after we've stabilized the property, now the more traditional lenders will come play because it's understandable. Oh, you've you've fixed all the risk. Oh, you, you have improved the rents. Oh, I see what you've done. And now we can give you, you know, that 3% loan that we long for. Right. So once all the repairs are done and all, you know, you've got the units rented out and you've got maybe a month or two of track record of those new stabilized rents, is that when you go to, for the good refi? Or are you, you know, double tracking it? How, how do you do that? Um, do you have to wait till you're all the way done with the repairs or do you kind of, cause it's hard to get those loans. I mean, not hard. It takes a while to get the loans, right? Well, the season that we've been in Mm -hmm. has been remarkably stressful for the lenders. Mm -hmm. Remarkably stressful for us too, right? Right. COVID was kind of a strange season. No one had ever expected it. Like who wants to lend money to an apartment building owner when we don't as lenders know whether you are going to keep all your tenants or keep your tenants, but get no income. Right. So underwriting those numbers was very tricky. So, yeah. Right. Well, we had the government helping by saying that yes. nobody had to pay rent. Right. Right. So, yeah. Um, but the, the, the refi that we're doing right now, for instance, um, we're refinancing at a 63% loan to value. We're going to drop our, loan payment by more than half because we're moving from six and a half percent to three, three point one, I think Mm -hmm. in our long-term loan, Mm -hmm. but we're not pulling out a bunch of cash. The reason for that was the lenders, the lending community has pushed back from the table a little bit and says, you know, we don't know if COVID 2.0 won't happen. We don't know what's coming. So we'd rather you have a low loan to value. We'll give you a very good interest rate but we don't want you taking your cash yet. Right. That started our refi cycle. I would tell you there was news even this week. Fannie and Freddie have concluded that they don't need the nine months of payment reserve any longer. Mm -hmm. 
uh, if you can believe it, just a month ago, if you wanted to get a loan, you had to have nine months of operating loan of loan payments in a cash account. Right. And the government wanted that in their escrow. So you couldn't mm-hmm. take it. You couldn't spend it on a new roof. It was their money because they were so afraid of COVID 2.0. Mm-hmm. Um, I know that some lenders today versus when we started our refi three months ago, month and a, two and a half months ago, uh, some lenders today are nodding their head again at getting some cash out, maybe giving you an 80% loan to value on a stabilized property. Mm-hmm. But as you can imagine, uh, that industry is going to rebalance itself as long as we keep playing normal, as long as the government stops helping. Right, right. So, um, yeah, right now. And just what to we're clarify, doing is- those are apartment building rules. Those are multifamily rules on the one to four. They want six months reserved. It's a little bit different. So don't freak out if you're trying to refinance your fourplex and you thought, yeah, you, you know, it, they're two different things. And I will speak. I, I do not know. Right. The other rules. I know how that my, the rules that affect what us with, yeah. and what my my lenders and my brokers are sharing with me. Um, mm-hmm. You're right. Like like you said, I'm also not an accountant or an attorney, right. so <laughs> I'm not an expert of all things. I'm just sharing with you what comes through my personal experience. But sure, sure. Um, but because we're uh, going to gain so much more cash flow from this new loan. After talking to our investors, our investors all nodded and said, "Man, that's a great idea. Let's do that." And so everybody's return, everybody's check is going to be robustly enhanced because now we're not spending it on debt. Right. And so everybody's well, excited that's going to be that. exciting for those investors, right? So the right investors, right? Certain investors are short term, ideally. So if they're participating in a tra- in a transaction like ours, and they thought, "Hey, in two years, I'm going to get half my investment back," that was pre COVID. We didn't know what could happen. But they might be saying, like I had one investor saying, Sterling, I really wanted my, that part of my cash back. What do I do? Right? So now we're having dialogues of choices for them. And if they want to swap out a position in the transaction so that they can get some of that capital back. But there was a change of seasons. COVID happened to all of us. Right. And the lenders, the lenders changed the rules. Not a business. It was decision. interesting what you shared with me. Uh, sorry. Um, what it just came to mind, what you shared with me, because we were kind of talking about vacancies and, you know, the government, you know, all that. And um, I thought it was interesting what you shared with me on your, like your Memphis area property, because you had so much cushion built in or because the rents were so low, you could afford the bump that happened with that, um, re- you know, uh, rent moratorium, right? So can, could you just yes. describe what happened with that building and what percentage occupancy because that's one of the fears i think for an investor is you know i'm handing over to you my cash now i've lost control i'm not controlling the situation i can't go pound on their door that idea by the way guys <laughs> but you know we're giving up control to you um and so so what was what was that like during covid and, and I, i'm mentioning the memphis one just because that's the one you you told me a story about can you kind of share what happened and what strategies you guys used through covid of course of course um yeah covid was a surprise uh, our average in our look back um we had about 15 percent of our property affected by covid the impact of covid and that includes people pushing back and saying, hey, I'm not going to pay rent anymore. I lost my job. I don't know what to do. And the government says I don't have to pay you. To, I really want to pay you, but I don't know how. Can you help me, right? There's all kinds of different personalities out there. But we also had a generous portion of our residents who just kept paying rent. They understood how the business worked. Paying rent is how we keep the lights on. There are stories in New York, for instance, where they have billboards that say, don't pay your rent. Right. They used, they had, uh, I was talking to an investor who's got a property there, 50% of their property were paying rent and 50% was not paying rent. And one of the paying the rent payers threw together a, not a website, like a Facebook page and says, in solidarity with those of you who can't pay rent, we're all going to stop paying rent too. <laughs> Wow. You, can't, you can't make some of this stuff up. Yeah, yeah. And 
all the while the government says, you know, you're always going to owe that rent. You just don't have to pay it right now. Yeah, it's they missed that come, part of the story. It's going to come due. Right. So a lot of people didn't hear that. They didn't so, hear that or hear it, yeah. Um, but what we were able to do and what we did to combat this. Because 15% is, is actually very good, right? People had 50% uh, yes. non-payers, right? So, yes. so what was your strategy in doing that? And I'm asking because... Uh, when we invest with any syndicator or you, it's like, how do you handle the problems, right? right. Protect our, our, protect our asset that we're invested in. Well, you, you made a really interesting comment earlier is, you know, someone's going to give over their money and lose control. Um, I would like to say it a different way. That is, I'm going to trust somebody with my money because I need my money to grow. So I really want to go with a group or a, per, a team that has shown extreme competence through good and bad times, right? Because the team is the one that's going to execute the business plan. And if, it's, if you're relying on, I like Joe, Joe's a great guy, I'm going to give Joe my money because Joe always makes me feel happy when I'm around him. You may have a decidedly different experience than I'm going to go with Fred because Fred's been doing this for 20 years. And he's seen market cycles and the way he adapts to that cycle was really fantastic compared to the way I would handle even my own investment if I was doing it by myself because of my other commitments or my obligations or my own experience, maybe, right? So right. that's one of the reasons we're investing, right? We're always targeting who can do the best for me, right? We end up becoming co-laborers, right? I'm working for you in that season of struggle. And so the late, the... The way we approached it on this project, actually our whole portfolio, is we took the rules, we reduced the rules of this new COVID relief down to a couple of bullet points. Yes, you have the permission not to pay rent. Yes, the COVID has impacted everybody. But based on the law, you will be required to pay. We made that very clear in a very easy way, not... Was this like a form pages. that you gave the tenants? Was this like yes. put in their rent payment reminder right. or something? And we have like, we do an email blast to our community because what really sets us apart is the social impact of our business. And we don't, we didn't talk about that today, but because of our relationships with our residents, we were able to communicate with everybody via email, via text. And of course, physically with some flyers, but we expressed this is the circumstance. This is not a pass. You'll be expected to pay. And by the way, we'd like to help you. And in that first brochure, we actually attached five or six different ways for people to get rent relief, actual financial help. We were surprised at the lack of interest. Nobody really worked very hard to fix the problem. Mm -hmm. But what we grew into was, okay, let's be more proactive. And so we threw some rent relief parties and that was an invitation to people to come have a hot dog, come have a hamburger, hang out with us. We'll give you soda and chips, mm -hmm. but we want to tell you what we're doing and how we'll help you. And we set up, passed a clipboard around. And after a few of these events, we really got a lot of it participation at first. How many did you hold? Uh, I would say Five, we six. held, we had four on one property and five on another. Okay. And there's still, and there's versions of that still going on now um, because we don't have to talk to the whole community anymore. Now we're just talking to the people that are struggling, but we had invited the whole community, even the ones that were doing well to come to these events because we were trying to say to them, look, if you know somebody who's in trouble, we can show you ways to help them because most people, even if they don't live in the building, you were just, that's right. most people have family that are struggling in one way or another, right? Even if we didn't personally struggle, we knew people that were struggling. So we were offering these workshops. And what we would do is we would help our team would fill out the paperwork for them so that they could get financial relief. And we had done the work to find the resources. We had federal programs, which were kind of late to the party. We had state programs, which were, you know, mostly in hand, ex existing before the event, kind of rent support for troubled families kind of program. Oh, yeah. Then there were the, small local groups that were fundraising to help local families. Mm. And we even went so far as to communicate with churches and benevolent organizations in the community to adopt families. And so we found we probably had four families 
adopted during this period where the a congregation or a large organization came together to raise funds to pay rent or electricity or food bills for a family in need, right? It's a mm-hmm. it's on the heart of people to care for others. Right. We made an or we organized it in a way that people really could. They would mm-hmm. get to know each other, right? They came they came to know each other. The those organizations would come to the property and deliver the baskets of food to this family. Wow. Would, you know, take pictures and selfies with them and tell them how much they loved them. It was really a, a uniting event, mm-hmm. uh, even in the midst of the frustration of it. Right. To watch the community come together to help each other. Now, again, even as times progressed, and here we are kind of at the end of the cycle, the federal government kind of came in at the end. Their solutions were helpful, a little clunky, but helpful. But we were, we've managed to recapture over 90%, actually, I think it's close to 95% of delinquent revenue. Oh, no kidding. Because of the work of our teams on site, our site staff, mm-hmm. and uh, the willingness of our residents to participate, right? Because we needed their help to participate so that we didn't break down relationship and just have to evict. So our eviction cycle is actually pretty low. We're uh, we have 228 units on one property and because of COVID, poor behavior of not paying, not letting us help you, not coming up to a solution, not being able to prove you were unemployed, those kind of things. Um, we've only had to evict about seven families. It might be eight, eight wow, families because of COVID out of 228. Yeah, that's over a, what is it now? A, we'll call it a 15 month ordeal. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, it's just been, it's been really wonderful. Mm-hmm. But that plays into that whole social impact side of our business that probably earned us the favor with the residents to even accomplish that. Right. Because I think that's a big lesson with COVID. So many people didn't have communication with their tenants. So, right. of course, when something bad happens, they're going to go hide. Right. Yes. So they're, they're going to even more avoid you than they would before. So so I think that's oh. brilliant to keep the keep a brilliant way to keep the communication going. Right. Yes. Uh, Probably was, never stop that now, right? Because have your well, community things so you keep that communication at that level. Well, and we have, so the nature of our business, what makes us unique isn't so much the fact that we buy apartments, but the fact that we care for the residents. So we bring outside services to care for those residents, whether that's classes on how to get out of debt or how to fix their credit or how to get a better job. We even mm-hmm. have job fairs that come to the property. Mm. So that people can get interviewed and actually hired on the spot for a better job than they might have had before or a change of career or somebody's coaching them in how their skills are transferable to a new industry. And so there's been a lot of activity in our properties. That's what we do on all our properties. And that entree gave us this, allowed us to be, to just segue right into the Corona issue Mm -hmm. with the work we had already done. And just like you said, we maintain those relationships. We're still going through that with residents. We're still improving. Now that COVID is kind of faded, we've begun to invite those parties back to play. So yeah, things are getting back to normal. Thank God. Okay. So just two quick, cause we went way over time. It's, it's I just realized we've been at this an hour and a half. So um, two questions I know um, that are easy. Um, so <laughs> It doesn't mean the answer will be short, but anyway. So Jason had a question just about uh, those bridge loans. Are they interest only, principal and interest? Typically, what do you get? The interest only version or? Yeah, we'll go interest only uh, because we're trying to keep our the appetite for cash as low as possible. Mm-hmm. And the industry expects it. Right. So you're not asking any real favors. Uh, when you say, oh, I'm in the mood for a bridge loan. Oh, you want interest only is what they think. So right. it's pretty. that's an easy sell. Well, because if you're only going to have the loan a year or two, why in the heck would you try and pay down principal, right? And the calculation will put a huge part of print. I mean, that payment will be really big for no reason, right? Right. I mean, paying principal is great. It's kind of setting aside a savings account in the asset. But if you can operate an interest only, what you're really generating for yourself is more operating capital, right? After debt, you now have money to spend. If it all goes to debt, 
you're very lean. You're not replenishing your reserves. You're not making distributions to your investors. Right. All of these things just get really tight. So cash flow gives you nimbleness and an ability to operate quickly. If you find a problem or if you have some new twist or some new turn, cash flow is king. So um, because we were in bridge loans during a couple with a couple of our properties during COVID, um, our cash flow, we still made distributions to our investors, even with the loss of 15% of our revenue, because our assets cash flowed so strongly. Right. So what were the the worst returns and the best returns over the last three years? And I know they're all different buildings, but, but that's a good one. You know, you had yeah. 15% vacancy, but you still paid out. So do you remember what the percentage was that you paid out? Yeah, we were meeting the 8% pref. Wow. That's um, awesome. But we did have one project that has been, we bought in March of last year. And we were expecting to make uh, distributions toward the end of the year. Um, not, yeah, toward the end of the year. And we were in the middle of COVID. And so we had to defer distributions on that property. We knew we were buying a distressed asset. We knew we were going to fix it. But again, because of COVID, we couldn't evict. We couldn't turn over. Mm-hmm. So our renovations were very modest. They were. And did you find problems finding workers too? Was that an issue last year? Like right. so many it, of us, like, where did all the workers go? That should be like a song, you know? I mean, yeah. it's incredible. Oh, and the price is just, phew, yeah. you know? It should be a sad song too. Yeah. Yes. Everybody disappeared. You couldn't get units painted. You couldn't. And, but residents weren't leaving, right? right? They had nowhere to go because no one else was moving, right? That whole transitionary nature of housing there were no vacancies for them to move into. So it really became kind of weird. Um, so in, in one respect, the business kind of got put on hold. What's interesting- So your, is, so your returns that you were going to pay out basically got deferred into the future. It's not that these people will not get their 8%. That's correct. You just have to wait till whenever to but pay it out. If you were talking about a day-to-day return, you would say, ooh, that property is has not performed as expected because of the- environment that overwhelmed the nation. But what has happened on the opposite side of that is we've watched rents move from 700 to 800, right? Our target rents were going to be 700. Right. Well, now target rents are 800. There's been this massive shift in the economy where people are now moving all over the place and everything's coming back to life. Right. Well, when returns, you raise wages, return, the overall return for that project hmm. will be unaffected. Right. That's interesting. Yeah, so, it's just so from, a month, from a return. month to month perspective, mm-hmm. there was an impact. But in the life of the project, and of course, the investment model is long term. In the life of that project, it will not be an effect to the investor. I mean, yeah, it won't be a meaningful as- effect. Right. I, and I think as investors in these types of properties, you know, your workforce got a huge raise. Right. So, you know, probably I mean, going all across the country, there's different minimum wages in all the markets we're in. But basically, you know, it seemed like a lot of markets got a 50 percent increase in their pay. So that helps them That's to right. pay. So more dollars are chasing that same apartment. So That's right. It's not you, the bad landlord, who decided, I'm just going to raise rents. No, because if no one was willing to pay that, they're not going to pay it, right? But all those people are in the same income category, chasing the same apartment for rent. So, yeah, it pushed rents up. It it's did. Incredible. It's a market movement. It's not a movement we created. Right. And, I mean, to keep it in perspective, right? Let's say someone invested with us $100,000 and they didn't get their eight pref for the year. That is an $8,000 distribution that didn't go out. But when you think about that $100,000 being returned to you and you're getting another $100,000 at the end, it makes the $8,000 delay feel insignificant. Mm-hmm. It did occur, but from a business perspective over time, there's a, so there's a solution to it. Right. So people investing in this, and I just want to be clear, this is not your lunch money that you're investing, right? This is money that that is set aside for that is supposed to work hard for you, harder than you work. So that one day that money has created more money for later, 
not right. for lunch, right? So I just want to be clear about that. Yeah, it's going to work for you, right? And, right. And, so the nature of our, and the nature of our business, right? Um, we typically work with accredited investors. That's a, a million dollars of net worth or more. Not including uh, your home. Not including your home. For right? those of us in California, very important part. <laughs> and if you're investing, if you have a million dollars of net worth and you're putting $100,000 into one of our projects, that is still only 10% of that liquidity, that net value, right? We're not targeting family or friends that have a $75,000 401k and they're going to put $75,000 in one project. I'd raise my hand and push away from the table and say, this isn't for you, right? Mm -hmm. This is right. Uh, that you should never invest like that, right? Eggs in one basket is the term. Yeah. But when you're diversifying your capital and you're trying to find places to land, the closer you get to a project, the closer you get to the actual activity, the less diluted your returns are because now you're participating in specific direct actions and you have less overhead, right? So you have less fees. You have a greater now, again, because that one project could struggle you might find you're feeling the emotions of that struck that, but it'd be like buying one stock, right? And watching it go like this, buying Bitcoin. Oh my goodness. It's on a tear. Oh, wait a second. It fell for a minute. It's not a day-to-day -day observation. That would keep you, are you saying that our, window of time. Our, all of us here at investors corner, we should not be calling our syndicator every day to see how things are going today. And then the next day, how are things going tomorrow? <laughs> Well, I don't think it'd be good for either of their health, right. um, but in practice, there's always a business plan that's being followed, right? And your measurement, what you should be measuring with your questions and your activity in your investments is, are we on track? If not, why aren't we? And how are we fixing it? Mm -hmm. Right? Because there's always struggles. Oh, you know what? We used to get flooring for $3 a foot. Now it's gone to $4 a foot. What are we going to do? it's okay. We also are getting this in rent. So it's offsetting that change in market cost for that product. Mm -hmm. Right. Or, you know what, we're going to buy a pallet. We're going to buy a container full of that stuff so that we can get our price back and keep buying it at the price we were buying. Right. These are just business strategies that were always ebbing and flowing in the course of ownership of anything today. So Sherry would like to know how many syndications you've done so far. So I don't know when she joined us, but you started um, you started your company in 2018, right? Yes. Okay. So uh, how we've many? done we've done four syndications so far. Okay. Yeah, we've raised six million dollars and we've got 532 units. I double checked my notes. Okay. Uh, Great. That's a question I had, and I think you answered it. Does the deal come first, or does the money come first? Um. If we're talking to people that want to mimic our business, fellow investors, fellow sponsors, mm. the relationships with money are slow. Your need to meet people and to create relationships is one of your number one activities. But of course, that money relationship won't come to play until you have a property. I have chased properties without enough friends. And I get the property tied up and now I've got a PSA or a purchase and sale agreement that's given me 60 days to close. And now I'm running around frantically trying to find more friends. Mm -hmm. That is a very uncomfortable place to be. You can solve that risk by finding some skilled friends. So we fixed that problem for us by going into the market and finding capital raisers, people that can raise bulk capital in a short window of time. That's their business. Mm -hmm. We don't use their services from the first day. What we do is we call our friends and we say, Hey, would you like to keep investing with us? We get some yeses. We get some, Ooh, bad timing. We get some, no, you know what? I'm all strung out. I'm on a bunch of other investors and investments and I'm not looking for anything new right now. Okay. We also get, yeah, I'm glad to come back in with a little bit more or a little, you know what, instead this time I'm going to give you a hundred grand instead of the 200 grand I gave you on the last one. Okay. But then we're going to come to this window where we're about to close and we haven't raised enough money. We've raised a million and a half, but we need two and a half million to close. 
Well, it's very nice to call up one of your specialists and say, you know what, we're a million short and you got three weeks. Can you do it? And by Friday, they've raised the million dollars, right? Takes all the stress away. Um, but your relationship building and the growing of your friendships, right? Because investors only invest with friends. You like to think they're all machines and they'll invest because your numbers are right. Mm -hmm. It's not true. Not in my experience. Uh, maybe institutional, but when you're talking to people and they're going to write you a check, they only want to write checks to people they believe in and they trust. Right. And you've got to build that relationship over time. Now, there are advantage, there are ways to streamline that as investors, um, right? You can have a great relationship with Athena. And Athena's team of relationships will look to her for her authority and go, oh, wow, that's great. She knows Sterling or she knows Fred. That's a great way to accelerate mm -hmm. your ability to make friends. But along the way, even... When even if somebody was interested in investing with us today, they're still going to call me directly and we're going to have a conversation. Right. Right. We're going right. to talk they, about they, each other. So it's not go to your website, open a window, put money in window. Right. No. Deposit money in my window. <laughs> I mean, we have a method for doing that. I have found all of our investors will fill out the form, will say they're interested in investing with us and then welcome our phone call. They do want to talk to us. Right. And so that's been the nature. And if you can start that early, um, that can really make a great deal of difference in the way you close and the way you sleep at night. Mm -hmm. And that's been ama the magic for us, right? We've been at this several years and now our friendship equation has grown. Yeah, to I such remember effect. those early days you describing that. That's really. Yeah. It was yeah, quite an adventure. important shift. Yeah. It was <laughs> quite an adventure. Well, good. I think I've answered. Oh, it looks like the Q&A box has more here. So I'm just going to see if there's anything critical. And if not, um, how would someone get in touch with you to maybe have a conversation with you? Our simplest way is to go to the website, right? You can get a bunch of education. You can get some uh, access to us. You can fill out some paperwork. You can look at some of our examples. That's refugeinvestments.com. And then there's probably uh, a contact us thing on there. Yeah, it has contact. It has fill out if you're interested in being on our list for a future investment opportunity. It has all kinds of different things on it. Um, Great. Pretty robust. But um, our, so you know, Sterling, you I just I just love um, I just love this question, Sterling. Um, do capital raisers get paid? And if so, how much do they get paid and how do they get paid? And it's this fabulous J Jason again. Uh, do they get part of the deal? Maybe you can raise, help raise capital and then get part of the deal, part of the cash flow. Can you, from your knowledge, explain what these guys, how they operate, how they get paid? All right. So we're going to go way up the ladder here. We're going to talk about big picture stuff. Right. Again, I'm not an attorney. Mm -hmm. But, um, and the state of California, for instance, kind of could have put a kibosh on capital raisers. If you are a broker, real estate broker, you have a brokerage license, a broker's license, mm -hmm. you can raise capital. Yeah, uh, but we have to find, follow all kinds of rules. So just follow all kinds of rules. Now, there are ways, yes, you can play above the syndication is a limited partner and a general partner category, right? Right. A limited partner might have 70% and the general partner might have 30%. But of that 30%, there are ways to play, right? You can be a professional capital raiser and you can take ownership in deals you raise capital for. That is pretty common in the nation. Um, it is more difficult to get fees for services than it is to get ownership. But because you're so, you play such a significant role in the business model, raising money has a business value. That's what I was saying about specialists who raise money. If you can make relationships with those folks, they will ask for things in compensation for their efforts, but they streamline your business growth and they accelerate it, right? Um, and then they spend their energy doing what is their superpower, right? If they raise money, they don't want to be buying apartments. They want to be raising money, right? Right. 
Um, so yes, Jason, you can get rewarded for raising capital and it is not uncommon. And it could be uh, his question about ownership or money. So it could be both one or the it other. It can be both. Um, I don't want to, we'll just assume for a minute that Jason's a broker. As a broker, California allows you to be a finder, allows you to be a capital raiser, and you can make a couple of percent on the money raised up to 5% of money raised. Mm -hmm. So if you raised $100,000, you might get 2%, $2,000 for that introduction. Because it's not that you necessarily are going to somebody's wallet and getting 100 grand. What you're doing is introducing us as an investment solution mm -hmm. to an investor you know. Mm -hmm. And then that investor does their own diligence, right? They're not expecting right. you to do that to protect them. You're just, they're expecting you to bring them good investments. Right. And we just happen to be on your list. That's the role you would play. Mm -hmm. um, there are ways, by the way, to start your own LLC and specifically just raise money. And then you come to the Sterlings of the world, Fred and Joe, and you say, I have a pool of investors that will come along behind me and we will invest in your deal. I have a, two people in my business life. That's what they do. So when I'm dealing with releasing a check, I only release a check to that investor. They have a quiver of investors behind them. Mm. Right? So there's a whole nother way to play, right? It's, Interesting. There's a lot I guess of that's a great conversation for another day is how, how you could do that, right? Right. I would describe that as raising money. That mm -hmm. would be a very good conversation about raising money. Definitely. It so we'll put be, that on the list. It tends to be a hot topic. Yeah. So Vera has a question she's dying to know. And I love this question um, because I demonstrate it with my properties all the time. And I'd love to hear you um, explain it to her as our last, last thing, guys. <laughs> Oh, it's a great conversation, thing. but, you know, we're going to have to have a snack break soon and, you know, other kinds of breaks if you get my drift. So, um, so Vera would like to know, um, you know, what's an infinite return? She's heard of people getting infinite returns. So uh, do you hold on to properties for infinite return? Um, an infinite return has a couple of different, couple of different definitions. One is, you got all of your cash returned to you. You gave me a hundred thousand dollars, but because of our cash flow and our refi, we gave you your cash back and we gave you your projected returns. So your initial principal is all back in your pocket. You back have in your nothing pocket. left in the property. That's but right. you don't kick me out of your group just because you gave me my money back. That's right. You keep giving me cash flow. Right. You would continue to get cash flow, but now you don't have an investment in the property. You just have your ownership. Well, now what is that $10,000 a, a year? What's that $10,000 a year against if it's not your $100,000, right? That becomes an infinite return because there's no basis in the transaction anymore mm -hmm. because you've got your hundred grand back in your pocket and you're going to go invest in something else. Right. Hopefully, so, hopefully another project with us, but right. that's what's happening. And so that can be an infinite return. Another example of an infinite return would be you came to play with us and you came into a position of where we're not. So we do have some long-term acquisitions. We're targeting properties that after we replenish and restore them, we're going to keep those properties in perpetuity. Who knows? Oh, right. so they're not part of the five-year plan that you described earlier. This is a, right. This is an alternative business model for some assets that we're looking at that would allow us to get into a property and not have a sale balloon, right? This timeline where I'm going to give you a huge tranche of capital at the end of five years that it insists that we sell. Right. The problem, the, the disadvantage is we're now making 16% cash on cash. That's why it's worth so much money to right. sell it in the open market. And but if we have long, that is a hassle. <laughs> and replacing it, yeah, now you're going to start over again. It's yeah. the struggle all over again. So if we can, if we have investors who like cash flow, uh, a lot of our almost retired folks are trying to put their cash in their IRAs or in their business ventures. 
They're trying to place their cash in assets that just generate cash flow. Because what they're going to get along the way are these tranches of cash that will support their lifestyle going forward. Well, they don't want us to sell and give them right. most of their money or this big windfall in five years because now they've got that brain damage of finding right. a new opportunity. <laughs> when if they would have just, because of the nature of their investment need, they would rather let it ride and just get those checks on and on and on and on. That can be another description of an infinite return, right? Because you don't really see an end to when it'll happen. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I don't, I don't know which way she was stating it. I gave it a really long answer. I apologize, but maybe that was excellent. A grand finale. Yeah. The grand finale, the way. So just to, to clarify a little more in the first situation, your infinite return is, you invested a hundred thousand, you got say the eight thousand a year cash flow, right? Yes. So we can do that math, eight thousand divided by a hundred thousand. But then that's a certain fixed return. But then how do you divide? Now Sterling refinances the building, gives you your hundred thousand back. You're still getting eight thousand, probably a little more because rents go up. So let but let's just say the eight thousand. So you take that same eight thousand divided by zero, what's that number? And that's what people mean by infinite return. There's no way to calculate the return because right. there's no, like you said, there's no money left in the property. It's just cash flow with no, no basis, no, that's right. No divide. You know, you can't divide that number. So it's infinite. So hopefully that that's helped. Right. Um, that's just an example, right? Yeah. And every property yeah. is different and every activity is different, but also every investor's appetite is different. What mm-hmm. the investor wants to accomplish. Mm-hmm. When we're younger in our life, we just need growth. We just right. need exponential growth because we're going to take risks. But right. when you get later in life, you, you want to take fewer risks. You're looking for cash flow. You're looking for, I don't want to upset the apple cart. Right. Right. Yeah. So, there's- so in the second example, then, um, even just because you hold the property long term doesn't mean you also can't get infinite returns in the sense that you might also refinance that building because you're going to keep it forever. In my mind, the ones I'm keeping forever, I'm more comfortable refinancing because I know the cash flow is going to keep going up. The debt is somewhat fixed, although that's yes. a story for another day. But, you know, so I, I, I know my rents are going to outpace any change in the payment. Right. So absolutely, I correct. think an example, too, you still could refinance, give them their principal back. And it's still infinite returns in that sense. But infinite in the sense that you're never going to set, we're all going to die before we ever sell that property. You're probably going to get, so if we can only give half of the principal back on the first refi, right? We've been the bridge for a couple of years, then we refi Mm -hmm. and we give a portion of that principal back. You won't see all of the return of your principal until maybe the second Mm -hmm. refi, Mm -hmm. right? Because the activity Mm -hmm. of that Mm -hmm. property is again, escalating. It's getting better and improving, but there's these moments in any property where cash is distributed in bulk. And the majority of those are either a refinance or a sale. Right. And if we've written the business model in such a way that we have to sell, we can't let half of our investors benefit from the sale and the other half try and stay in because now we don't own the property anymore. Right. What we're really talking about is investors that want to stay longer. They have a longer term business outlook and they're willing to stay in longer. It just means their money is more patient. It's just a different type of investor. Right. I like that. Their money is more patient. <laughs> I love that. Well, thank you so much, Sterling. You've been so generous with your time. I think it was a fabulous conversation. Um, I'm so I'm so honored to have seen just in the short time how you've how you developed your system and you know through thank trial you. and error. Your I mean just everything you've gone through and and you, it sounds like you have some pretty awesome assets under your belt already. So more power to you. <laughs> uh, you've you been a joy, Athena. Thank you for sharing. Uh, I think your audience is benefits from you every time they hear. Oh, so thank you. Keep up the good work and thank you for including me. It's been fun. Yeah, for sure. Uh, I love talking about our business. I could do it I know. again. I get so excited. I could do this for hours and it's like, yes. okay, we do have to Got do it. other things in life. So <laughs> when, when you told me that we've been on it for so long, I was shocked. <laughs> yeah, right. I know me too. I was like, oh my God. So thank you guys for hanging. Thank you for your wonderful questions. Indeed. Reach out to Sterling if you want, you know, a more one-on-one conversation and uh, we'll see you soon. Thank you. Blessings.
This has been another episode of My Cashflow Academy's Investor's Corner with your host, Athena Paquette Cornier. We wish you all the success you deserve as you use what you've learned here out in the real world. Check out the blog post for this episode, along with many more helpful resources at mycashflowacademy.com.